This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brad Cresswell. Joining me today are the Toledo Symphony's principal second violin and artistic administrator Merwin Sue, the TSO's marketing director Felicia Canny, and a little bit later on in the podcast we'll be joined by music director Elaine Trudell, who will call in by phone. And we have a very special guest today. Wait for it. <laughs> that is Aaron Wiley, who is a clinical psychotherapist here in Toledo. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yes, I'm excited to be here. I'm thinking we should have a, a clinical therapist on staff for this program. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, in case you're wondering, the uh, topic for today is stage fright, or its clinical term, performance anxiety. This is a great big issue. We have a lot of stuff to talk about, some stories to share, and I think that is something that, you know, you don't have to be a performer to suffer from performance anxiety, because as humans, you know, that's what we do. It's all about our social interactions, and sometimes the fears that those present as well. So we're going to dive a little bit into the issue, but Aaron, I wonder if you would start, just kind of introduce yourself to listeners and, and give us an idea of what it is that you do. Sure. So I'm a therapist here in Toledo. I own a private practice called the Willow Center up on Airport Highway, and I've got um, 20 other therapists um, that I've hired to join me on our mission to help Toledo have better mental health. So we do a lot of um, family work, so I see a lot of couples personally, mm -hmm. but we've got people on staff that see kids and teens, typical issues, anxiety, depression, grief, and loss, mm -hmm. um, but things you know more specific like teens who are having trouble in school, mm -hmm. LGBT issues. So we kind of cover the gamut. Now, can you sort of give us a primer for, for those folks who maybe don't necessarily know exactly what performance anxiety is? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that condition? Sure. Um, I think when we're talking about mental health issues, we have to recognize that at the very root of it, um, it are your thoughts. And so you have a thought and what it ends up doing is setting off a physiological chain of events. So most people experience anxiety um, initially as a thought, um, and it's typically fear of not performing well, of forgetting words or making mistakes, not doing what you intend to do in a perfect performance. Um, and that kind of anxiety starts a whole chain of hand sweating, shortness of breath, pupils dilating. It's fight or flight. <laughs> you start to freak out. Your stomach gets What's happening right I, now. I, I, <laughs> I, I, yeah. Judging by Felicia's expression, she's ready to dart for the door. <laughs> You're putting all the thoughts. In, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> it can be. If people yeah. do that, yes, that it can we're, be. We're not going to even get through the podcast at this point. <laughs> all of us. Thinking about it. Well, as far as stage fright goes, I mean, that that is, a, I guess, a compartmentalization of performance anxiety, mm -hmm. people that perform on the stage in front of lots of people, right? We've all had that dream. Have you had that dream where you're unprepared or you show up to a, a performance and, you, and they switch it on you and you have no idea what you were supposed to be doing and... Yeah. It feels like a Far Side cartoon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It happened like yes. last week. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> nice. Now, we should clarify, I used to be an opera singer. Felicia, you're an oboist. Uh, Merwin, you play the violin, obviously, mm -hmm. still do. <laughs> And Erin, do you have any musical background at all? My undergraduate degree is in vocal music performance and theater. So I lived in okay. New York and worked there performing and across the country. So yes, musical theater is my thing. Oh, how cool. Yeah. Erin has actually performed with the Toledo Symphony, which was why I thought she was the perfect choice. To yes. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that makes me want to hone in on you, Erin, because you're wearing two <laughs> uh -oh. hats here. Uh -oh. It's true. <laughs> you're the psychotherapist, but you've also mm -hmm. been on stage. Mm -hmm. And have you ever battled stage fright in always, your singing time always yeah. yes oh my goodness every time even as recently as i performed last year um up at the croswell opera house when they did ragtime yeah. and i played mother which is the lead role um and it was terrifying I, and i had not been on stage for a few years and taken a break um so yeah i have like a whole arsenal of weapons that i use to be able to manage the anxiety because it can send you in a full-on panic and as a singer also if you um you know play woodwinds any of the um, yeah. You need some air. You need to breathe. <laughs> and if you're breathing shallow and you can't catch your full breath, it makes you even more panicky. Mm -hmm. 
So there's. So a, what, what do you do though in mm-hmm. a situation like that? You're feeling the fight or flight before you go out. Mm-hmm. How do you channel that into your performance? Mm-hmm. So usually I try to do at least 15 minutes of something aerobic earlier in the day, if not more. But just get your body moving so you can get some of the nervousness out, like physically move. Um, I think we we mistakenly believe that when you're in a full panic, what you need to do is calm yourself down, which is true. But one of the best ways to do it is get like a rebound calm down by expending a whole bunch of energy real quick. And then you get to a lower baseline where you can calm down after you've expelled some energy. Um, I personally, and this doesn't work for a lot of people, but... Um, I distract myself. And one of the ways I distract myself is I eat before performances. A lot of people are afraid to eat because their stomach is nervous. But I have a theory that if you eat, your brain, which normally shuts down digestion, is like, oh, well, now we have to digest food. Yeah. And it's more energy. <laughs> you trick the goes. brain. Yes. That's brilliant. And, and mostly just talking to myself in my head and, and reminding myself of why I'm doing it or actually walking through the steps of where will I be? What do I say when I stand in certain places and just calmly reviewing ahead of time. I, I am totally on board with any therapy that ascribes uh, a lot of eating. Right? I've, I've always... <laughs> That's your professional opinion, I take yes. it. And yeah. honestly, for me, it's like the, the more junky the food, the better. <laughs> yes. It's something that wouldn't work, I think, as well for wood- woodwind players, but I've always liked to eat extraordinarily spicy food hmm. right before I go on the stage if I'm <laughs> feeling nervous because I, really? kind of, I kind of feel like that... I mean, there's this sort of you know, physiological response yeah. that when you're eating spicy food, your body reacts as if you're on fire. So it kind of soothes you with these. Yeah, like, yeah that's true. Uh, and mm-hmm. so I always use that to kind of calm down a little that's bit. That's very right? clever. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so I always found go. that uh, a couple <laughs> glasses of wine were what uh, put me in the mood. You know, that there's, uh, does not work <laughs> as well for a violinist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like taking notes <laughs> right yeah. now. I'm writing everything yeah, down. Yeah, write it down. <laughs> this is a you know therapeutic podcast. We're yes. here to offer great <laughs> advice. N- none of it, you know, legally binding, I should add. <laughs> oh, yes. We need the disclaimer. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, well, you all know the great opera singer Enrico Caruso, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, early part of the 20th century, one of the great singers of all time. There, there's a great story about him where I don't know where it was, whether it was Metropolitan Opera or a different opera house. But he was alone in his dressing room before the performance, and outside, people could hear him yelling, and they were thinking, who is he yelling at? And he was in there, people put their ear to the door, and he was yelling, va via, va via, va via, which means get out, get out, get out, in Italian. And finally, one of his assistants opened the door and asked if he was okay, who are you yelling at? And he says, I'm yelling at the voices in my head that tell me I can't do it, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. And that was how he was preparing for a performance by by you know entering a, a verbal mental fist fight mm-hmm. with with all those doubts that mm-hmm. were going on in his head would you would you say that was a, a, a good choice, Aaron? <laughs> yeah, I mean, usually um, when I'm talking to athletes or performers about how to stay focused, you know, typically you want to keep it positive and say focus on like a good intention, like I've got this or I'm calm and cool and maybe not focus on the distress, but a way, I mean, it sounds similar. Sometimes I um, suggest that people have an object, like for public speakers, maybe a pen on the podium um, or for performers, like a spot on the wall. And, and I do say like throw that energy, like imagine it's like a backpack full of like distress and you're like taking it off and flinging it at something or putting it into an object to get it off of you throw your distress at somebody else (laughs) maybe something else see if if they catch it (laughs) i want to get into a couple of stories here felicia before we got on on uh, mike you mentioned uh, your experience as a page turner and that that is something that immediately elicited uh, a a response (laughs) from both merwin and myself (laughs) i have horrible page turning experiences in my past so, Aaron, have you ever turned a page? I, I was a page turner, <laughs> turner for a piano player for a yeah. show once in junior high. <laughs> so, yeah. so we were all former page turners. Yeah. I think that's a now this, thing. Now, this, yeah, it's a club, right? We, <laughs> yeah. can, we can start We're a club. Support, cl- uh, yeah. support group. We need a support group. I, you know, and I'm put in mind of, a, and I think this was true, there was an actual person turning pages for a recital whose name was Paige Turner. Right? Are you oh. kidding? Yeah. Are you kidding? Can you believe that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> But, okay, uh, good. <laughs> I have some music for you, Felicia, to tell your story. You're going to tell us. Uh, okay, let me pull that down a little bit. You know, I, I'm glad that Aaron talked a little bit about the aerobic 
type exercises before um, doing something stressful or high anxiety. And um, so prior to the story, <laughs> wow, this is really, really scary. this is really spooky. Yeah. <laughs> um, so prior to uh, going uh, in this recital to turn pages for this performer, I had to carry the harpsichord um, with two other gentlemen, and I am not a strong person, <laughs> mm. so it really took a lot out of me. <laughs> and then uh, going into uh, the, I had never turned pages before. I was a freshman in undergrad, and um, so I was I'm honored, but also very very frightened. Yeah. And then in the middle of the performance, um, the the oboist instead of playing all of the 16th notes in the run, I think it was like 64 measures of 16th notes that were constantly going. All of a sudden, halfway through, uh, he started playing every other beat. So it was like beat one and beat three. And then I just sat there frozen and I didn't know where anyone was at all. And then I thought, should I stand up right now and just like get the page ready to turn? I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. So then I like slowly lifted myself up from the seat and like leaned my arm carefully <laughs> over the page and then I folded the corner because I thought that was a good thing to do <laughs> and then I I tur- I didn't know where I was and I was like maybe maybe the the harpsichordist will give me a head nod I didn't see any head nodding whatsoever oh, no. I so I I don't know really what happened I think it was a blur but I turned the page and and we're, we're all alive, so. Everyone lived. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It was yeah. really scary. Yeah. I, I, I thought I was screwed you know, up the whole recital. <laughs> basically, an experience like that, it's like landing a plane. Any landing you can walk away from <laughs> is Success. a good landing. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, when I was a page turner one time, the one time that sticks out of memory, and I don't even remember where this was or who it was for. I do remember, however, that... I was so anxious to turn the page that I ripped the paper out of the book. <gasps> right? Oh, that was God. strong. When, when I turned the page. <laughs> and and I not only ripped it, I sent it flying. Oh, my. Wow. And dramatic. So, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so the uh, poor pianist actually You were a stopped. tenor at the time. Uh, right? Yeah. Something, <laughs> something like that. Time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I had to go and, 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 and collect, you know, the page to a few <gasps> oh, chuckles my. from the audience oh, and no. set it back up. and <laughs> And have them. That start. happened to me. Yeah. In eighth grade. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah, I was not in eighth grade when, <laughs> it, when this happened. I should have known better. Um, Merwin, you want to tell us a page turner story, or do you have something else? Hang on. There we go. <laughs> well, I'm I'm torn actually. <laughs> Sorry. No. Oh my gosh, Merwin. <laughs> wow. I Good one. I Boo. actually did uh, turn pages for a uh, former guest of the podcast, Bill Eddins, when he was here, and it was when we were doing an artist up close series. So we were on the Peristyle stage, but the mu- where the orchestra musicians were seated was where the audience was sit- sitting for this chamber music series. Oh. So we'll be on the Sunday were- after the Masterworks concerts, oh. and we would just turn the piano around and play towards the back of the Peristyle. And so um, Bill was playing with four members of the orchestra, the Shostakovich Piano Quintet, and I was standing and I was turning the pages, and you just have to, it, the second movement goes so quickly, you have to just jump up and down and up and down. And then partway through I became convinced I was going to fall off the peristyle stage oh no yeah, and so I, I had this sort of scary. weird like sense that like <laughs> <laughs> that, that was Mozart <laughs> laughing by the way and I just and I was I was very all of a sudden I, was, I would like stand up turn the page and sit down very slowly <laughs> and then stand up turn the page it was very weird but that that reminded me we were just playing the Beethoven third piano concerto and Beethoven very famously had not actually finished the piano part so he had like so the the page turner was was turning pages and there was just like scrawls of random things that (laughs) reminded beethoven of something and the beethoven would nod at him at random intervals and he would just turn a page so that, that was what i was thinking of I, I think if I was turning pages for Beethoven, I would be nervous, right? <laughs> that would definitely be a nerve-wracking experience. Yeah. That's great. I want to read a little bit of a, a, a post that somebody made on a Facebook page. We were asking people about you know performance anxiety and how they deal with it. And this comes from the principal bassoon at Toledo Symphony, Casey Gazelle. 
And, and I'll just read it for you, Aaron. then I want to get your impression from it, okay? She says, uh, I never had any issues with performance anxiety until during my undergrad degree. I went to one audition I really wanted to win, and it all hit me at once like a ton of bricks. I was completely unable to play and had to leave the stage. Wow. A terrible experience there. Okay, after that, I went to my college library and checked out all the performance psychology books. Nowadays, there's a lot of amazing resources, specifically written for musicians. But back then, we only had a few good books and had to borrow wisdom from other activities like archery, golf, tennis, yoga, meditation. And this was the beginning of many lifestyle changes for me. I've used a lot of different ways to upgrade my mental skills. Probably the most helpful were Zen meditation, uh, working with a New Zealand Olympic rowing team coach, and Alexander Technique lessons. Oh, yeah. I know a lot of people That's use right. Alexander Technique. She says, I'm really glad for the experiences brought to me through dealing with this. It expanded my thinking and music making in many ways. Again, that's from Casey Gazelle, uh, Principal Bassoon at, at Toledo Symphony. I want to get your um, reactions to all of this. But before we start, Aaron, and I should have done this before, I want to bring in the uh, Ask the Expert uh, introduction here for you. Set the tone, I right? so fancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't break out into song just yet. <laughs> Take it away, Erin. What did you think of that post? Yeah, um, I, I, one of the things that stands out to me is how um, so many people learn in their life, um, and this is everyone, to manage anxiety by pushing it down. The analogy I like to use is holding a beach ball down in the ocean. There's only so long that you can maintain control because it's impossible. It's an illusion. We cannot constantly have control. And at some point, that beach ball is going to come shooting up. And so it's interesting that it surprised that performer. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Being able to learn to train your mind and harness the power of your mind and specifically learning how to relax your body and gain um, mental focus is a great tool to help focus negative energy. And it will also um, help grow the parts of your brain that are responsible for calming you down. So in the future, you can apply it to other situations. Yeah, nice. Um I need, See, I need someone yeah. to follow me around and do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get you know we're handing out applause here, but we also have a bad buzzer just in case. <laughs> uh, usually that goes to me. Um, I want to take a moment here and and bring up something which I thought is kind of peripheral to this discussion, and that is uh, the ghost frequency. Has anybody heard of the ghost frequency? You know what that is. Yeah. This is infrasound. People say that. You know, if you hear or listen to infrasound, which supposedly is out of the uh, range of human hearing, mm -hmm. um, it, it induces anxiety, right? I mm -hmm. thought it would be a fun experiment. I've uh, actually got it here. I'm going to uh, turn it on. This is part of a radio show. Yeah. We're going to listen to a sound that cannot possibly be heard <laughs> over the radio. That's what we do. It's that high of a frequency. Yeah, low of a frequency, oh, low. actually. Oh, low, okay. This is at 18.98 hertz. Uh, supposedly oh anything below 20 hertz is hard to hear, but you can kind of hear it. If you listen carefully for a second, you can hear a little bit of a rumble. Yeah. I'm feeling it. Yeah, that's the ghost frequency. So they call it that because... You know, people claim that it makes you see hallucinations and spirits and things like that. So, Aaron. I'm looking for, around. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Don't see anything. Not yet. Felicia is looking rather skeptical right there. But I thought it would be fun <laughs> if, you know, in addition to the anxiety that this podcast normally uh, creates, if, <laughs> if we added to it by, by adding in the little ghost frequency for a while and, and see if people start to feel, you know, anxious towards the end and then you can help them Aaron right <laughs> okay. I do feel walk them through it and we're I doing can a little see in therapy. your screen the yeah the the yes. column of well yeah it looks scary it there wow. on the screen yeah I'm not quite sure why that is but um yeah there it is okay <laughs> well we'll leave that run for just a little bit we're still waiting for our music director Elaine Trudell to call in anxiously we're anxiously yeah. awaiting. Oh, we're I anxiously awaiting <laughs> well there he is saved by the bell let's see if I can do this without <laughs> cutting him off hi how are you uh, well I'm nervous <laughs> <laughs> 
I can tell you why you're nervous. It, it's because we're, we're talking about stage fright, but we also just started playing something called the ghost frequency, which is a an 18.98 hertz signal, <laughs> supposedly below the level of human hearing. And okay. so we thought we would do this experiment and let it play and see if it makes people anxious or not. From what I understand, really? this is like what a bass trombone tuning is like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you have to have loose, loose lips for that sort of thing, right? There we go. <laughs> Case in point. Our music director, Elaine Trudell, has joined us by phone. Uh, Elaine, in addition to Merwin and Felicia, we also have Aaron Wiley here, who is a clinical psychotherapist. We brought her on board just to talk to you. I hope that's okay. <laughs> it's an intervention. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're having an intervention. Surprise! You know what? This ghost frequency Hello, thing is... is <laughs> This ghost frequency thing is, is starting to make me really nervous, so I'm going to turn it off here. There we go. That's much better now. Sigh of relief, right? So people told their performance anxiety stories, and I'm sure you, Alain, as a trombonist and a conductor have had your fair share. Um, do you think I could ask you to – do you think that you could share a specific story with us, a, a case of um, – stage fright that you may have suffered or, or are you just immune to this sort of thing sure well, well hang on uh, a second i have music for you okay. <laughs> okay everybody else has suffered through this music i was just so going to say that brad now it's your turn <laughs> L- let's hear from you well, Elaine. uh well actually um, um as um maybe it's because i've had uh, a lot of experience as a player uh as a conductor i i don't nervous and there's so much to do there's so much you have to be focused on non-stop as a conductor that you don't really have time to be nervous but as a player um i was also very focused i it, stage fright was not a big thing for me but i do remember one instance where i really had no idea what was happening and i got really nervous yeah. so i i can tell you about that i was playing a recital uh, in germany somewhere and um uh, and um and and I started playing uh my first piece was on the sackbut, which is the 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 ancestor of the trombone. The sackbut. Uh, we want to make sure everybody heard that. The sackbut, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, the sackbut, yeah. And I started playing, everything was you know, I was ready, I got warmed up and uh, I I was, you know, do, do doing what I do. And then it seemed like nothing was working. Now and, and I was thinking, I was going like but I don't think I'm nervous. I, you know, like you're speaking to yourself while, while you're doing the, the performance. <laughs> I was going like, yeah. I, I think I'm fine, but, <laughs> but it's not working. What's you, happening? You can talk yourself into being nervous. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I was doing what? Anyway, so I finished the piece, but I barely finished. I, I, and then I, I thought, why? Yeah, of course, then, then you get nervous for real, yeah? <laughs> And then I, I was going, what happened? And I noticed after I put it away, that before taking my trombone backstage for the next piece, because then I switched to, to the normal trombone then that people know. And and I noticed that my tube of my uh, my lower slide was out. So I actually played the piece with about half an inch of space between the tubing and the rest of the instrument. That's why things were not coming out. Wow. <laughs> you made it through the whole uh, thing? Wow. Yeah. Well, it, it was no, it was a short piece. It was like a five-minute piece. Oh, okay. But it was five minutes sure. of like, I never worked so hard to get the air across the instrument. Of course, there was a hole in it, you know? <laughs> so, but, I, 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 but, you know, I, I never thought it might be like, a, um, how do you say, a mechanical malfunction in the instrument. I I started thinking maybe it's me, but I think I'm okay. But I'm not okay. I don't. So you start playing games with yourself, and I went like I picked up the instrument, played a few notes, and I went, oh okay, something else happened. So yeah. anyway, that's, oh, I uh, always think it's a malfunction. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, but, I don't um, want you piloting yeah. any of planes that I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that 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 was a very interesting experience because it shows that. Uh, Sometimes, you know, your mind can play tricks on you. Do you still have that sack butt? Oh, yes. Uh, that, yeah. no, that one, actually. No, that one I sold. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, a pawn well, shop somewhere. First, 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 first I got it fixed, and then I, and then okay. I sold it. Uh, and well, then that I was got nice. another one. That, and, and the other one didn't really falter, so that that's good. <laughs> yeah. you got to bring that sack butt in one of these days. We'll have a little, a little oh, party. Yeah. yeah, a little demonstration. Yeah. 
Well, I do okay. have a, a a quiz, and I'm glad you're here, Elaine, okay. because this will be a fun quiz. Th- this is uh, actually called Seven Bad Habits of Highly Effective Composers. Okay. Oh. So okay. we have uh, seven different case studies here. I've given them all to Erin, and she's going to read off um, different clues. I have three clues for each case study, and you have to identify who the composer is. She'll read the clues one at a time, right? And and we'll see if we can get it. Um, let me bring in some special quiz music here for this. This helps. <laughs> yeah. Just to induce a little anxiety, right? <laughs> okay. There, get a little beat. Got it. Am I am I rapping? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Go for it. Case Surprise. study one. <laughs> okay. This is a Let's social experiment. <laughs> All right. So the first case study. This composer often left uneaten trays of food around his apartment and it smelled badly. Cut a hole in his wall so he could have a view of his favorite cathedral, and once raged over a lost penny and wrote a piece about it. Sounds like uh, Wagner. Is it Wagner? No, it's not oh. Wagner. Elaine, you know, who wrote the rage uh, over a lost penny? It's a great piano piece, and, and and this is somebody who was infamously irascible, and eventually went deaf. Oh, Beethoven. Yeah, Beethoven. 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 Good job. <laughs> Man, that sheep. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, St. Bernard's. Yeah. <laughs> He's very upset. Actually, got five clues for that one, but that's okay. Let's hear number two. All right, number two. Founded a drinking club and often had to be dragged away from it to conduct his music. That's not Elaine. <laughs> Stopped composing 20 years before his death and wrote his country's unofficial national anthem. Who would that be? Yeah, I know, I know that one. Go for it. Go for it, Elaine. Sibelius. Sibelius, that's right. Yay! Okay, one for Impressive. Merwin, one for Elaine. You know, I thought it was Mozart at first, but then when you said 20 years before his death, I was like, oh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, he was 15 when he stopped. <laughs> okay, Aaron. All right, number three. Once drew his sword on a student, also spent time in jail for insubordination, was at the center of a famous musical dynasty despite his ill temper, wrote well-tempered music. Who would that be? I never really Bach wrote. Uh, CP. But I, I extended you the courtesy of assuming you meant Johann Sebastian yes. Bach. Yeah. <laughs> Johann so Sebastian Bach. So many people, like so many people of that era drew swords on people. <laughs> yeah. It was just Imagine. a thing to do. Like didn't narrow it down Emotional at all. dysregulation. Yeah. <laughs> you should do that wow. at the office. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Not often. I'm writing down. I'm writing that down. Emotional dysregulation, <laughs> because that is that describes like pretty much my behavior in a nutshell, right there. <laughs> dysregulation. Okay, where are we at now? All right, number, number four. four owned twelve identical gray velvet suits and wore one at a time until they wore out. He left six unworn at the time of his death. <laughs> This is the strangest one. Ate only white food like eggs, sugar, shredded bones, and the fat of dead animals. And gave his works eccentric titles like Flabby Preludes for a Dog. That should give it away. Yeah, it's Seti. Eric Seti. Oh, wow. That's really, I did not know that. How did you? Fascinating. Yeah. There's like a new Sati biography, and that should be titled Flabby Preludes for a Dog, is what the title of the biography that will should really be titled. Sell. Yeah. All yeah. right, number five was obsessed with dead bodies and often hung out at funerals and morgues. May have tried to steal both Schubert and Beethoven's skulls. <laughs> Suffered from numeromania and counted things compulsively, including the number of measures in his music. And was also obsessed with Wagner and even dedicated a symphony to him. Who would that be? Should we be able to get this? The Wagner Symphony? Well, I guess it's, I guess it's Bruckner, right? Yeah. yeah. But that didn't... I would have guessed somebody entirely different. Like I'm, who? Why are you looking at barely. me? Oh. <laughs> 
I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, just hanging out in morgues. I thought Berlioz would have done that. Yeah. yeah. But, well, evidently, <laughs> Bruckner was uh, present at when they exhumed Beethoven oh. and Schubert to move them, and and he went into both of their coffins and cradled their skulls. And somebody claimed that he <laughs> may have tugged a little bit on, oh, on no. Schubert's skull. Oh. With the, that, that you know. Oh my. Maybe try this, to steal is it. this is disturbing. Okay, yeah. this, I want to. Okay, there's got to be a clinical term for that, right? Um, yeah. uh, we'll Obsession. get back to you. I think you. we just call that sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this number six, I actually think I know this one. Okay. When bored, he sometimes jumped over tables and chairs, meowing like a cat. He was very, very fond of fart jokes. And the first thing he wrote after his overbearing father died was a musical joke. Yeah, your microphone just fell. It's the ghost. Well, yeah. We have summoned them. That the note must frequency. have worked. Yeah. Anybody know who that was? Well, Aaron, do you want to answer? Is it Mozart? Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Yay! I one saw Amadeus. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know. All right, and the last one. He designed his own clothing out of bath towels. <laughs> had an uncomfortably <laughs> close relationship with his mother, leading to rumors of incest. And often took a romp through country gardens wearing his towels. Yeah. Anybody got that? You know, I feel like that's a really efficient use of fabrics. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, you know, when you step out of a shower, yeah, you just, just put, your put it on, right on and then you air dry or something. You're good to go for <laughs> yeah. the rest of the day. Yeah, we should now, this person trend. was also a famous uh, concert pianist, an Australian composer, and, and he often wore his bath towels on stage. So... Country Gardens is actually the name of one of his famous pieces. Merwin, you look like you're you're about to say the name. No, no? I actually don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> Alan, <laughs> come on. This is your... <laughs> yeah, Alan oh, got Percy it. Percy Granger. Oh. Percy Granger. <laughs> He's an yeah. interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. But it's hard to tell who won on this because Elena Merwin was sort of neck and neck there for a while. But I'm going to give it to to Aaron because she got one right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So Aaron is the winner of our quiz. <laughs> Excellent. So I, I don't know that we've, you know, come to any conclusion about what to do for stage fright or stage anxiety. Uh, Aaron, would you, you know, if you were just to sort of generalize and say to folks who are suffering from doing anything in front of other people, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. or meeting people, mm-hmm. I mean, that's probably the situation that most people, people find themselves in a social situation. You say, hello, you meet somebody, then what happens? You know, there's small talk Mm -hmm. or there has to be a different (laughs) avenue that that people can take. Sure. Well, hang on a second. (laughs) This is not spooky at all. (laughs) Delightful wisdom. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, I turned off the ghost frequency thing a while back. (laughs) I think that um, preparing by having um, escalating challenges is often helpful. So if you can try smaller challenges that lead you up to the bigger one, I mean, it's um, really like exposure therapy, right? Like mm-hmm. I've had people who are afraid of dogs. And so I start by having them, they're like, there's a dog in the other room and I have the people make the dog bark and I say, do you hear there's a dog in the other room? And we just sit there and I say, okay, so your heart's racing. Let's pay attention to what your body is doing. <laughs> and then like we see, like, so how do we calm down knowing that this sounds There's more something. like torture than, it, than, than <laughs> escalating therapy. challenges. It's only for people who want to do it. Otherwise, okay. it would be torture. So you have to be motivated. Um, but I also think there's something about re- like remembering what is the worst thing that could happen. And for some people, like they would say, oh, in a social situation, I would be speaking with someone and then I wouldn't know to say and I'd feel so embarrassed. And I'm like, and that is a, a source of sheer terror. But yeah. say, right, but you're not going to die. And the fight or flight response makes you think you're going to die and then you won't. So the worst thing is you feel stupid and you feel embarrassed. But, but the dog will bite live. you. Okay, well, the dog, <laughs> yes. That's, that's, there the always dog is, is that. Yeah. That was my thinking <laughs> when uh, I was a kid. 
<laughs> right. But then, like, but typically, then, you know, statistically, what are the odds? You're probably safe. So I think just using your brain to talk yourself through it, developing self talk is really one of the best skills I think people can have for all situations. Yeah. But what do you think, Alain? I mean, I imagine you've engaged in a lot of self talk throughout the years as a performer and conductor. But first of all, I'm curious, and I think listeners will be curious. Before you go out on stage with the Toledo Symphony or any of yeah. your other ensembles, I mean, are, are you nervous? Are you feeling energized? What's your state of mind normally? I'm very, very focused. Um, um, I, I, I don't have like stage fright, honestly. Uh, but it's, it's not because I don't. I, it's because I channel it in a, in another place. Because it's the same energy for me. I mean, ma'am, I, I mean, I don't have a scientific like study to to back it up, but I think it's the same energy that you use to be nervous than than you used to have to uh, to to get that like fifteen twenty percent better at a, at a concert. It's mm-hmm. the same energy, but just channeled at a, at another place. So excitement or anxiety, you know. So you, if you can if you can see all the positive that this little you know jolt gives you. And, and just use it as uh, something that, that gives you a little extra, then, then I think you're, you're, at a, you're starting to be at a, a good place. Now, that being said, I, everybody has their little nervous trait, and, uh, and they, they, they can come out in different ways. For me, Zion, <laughs> so I look like I'm actually very, very, like, way too relaxed, but it's just, you know, uh, it's a tick, you know? So I start yawning a little bit before, and... Um, and and also it helps the breathing and I I don't know it's, it's just something I've done and and you have to remember I'm a wind I'm a brass player and I, so when you play wind instrument you've worked on your breathing a lot through your studies and when I used to teach at the Conservatoire the trombone also I had a lot of students you know that that wanted to deal with stage fright and that and and for me I had to learn to put myself in their place and to to see what kind of uh, exercise they could do. Uh, don't want to over uh, analyze it because you know you don't want to get a uh, how do you say paralysis by over analysis. You know, it's, it's, uh, like we're doing <laughs> in the podcast, right? <laughs> no, 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 but no, no, but we're, we're talking now. We're not performing. That's fine. Yeah. But oh, if, wow. if you're if you if you're leading up to a performance, you don't want to start uh, analyzing everything. You need to have actually a plan of something you're going to do. So mm-hmm. it could be as easy as three really deep breaths, but keeping your shoulders down consciously and focusing on your. If I want to put it like uh, very uh, simply, like your 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 tummy, you know, just breathing lower. So that, that I have two words that I used to say to my uh, my students. I say slow and low. You know, breathe slow and breathe low and relax. You don't have to breathe like 20 times because you're going to hyperventilate. Yourself. But just <laughs> three nice, no, but three nice little breaths. It's like a, it's like a, a little ritual, you know, three yeah. nice little breaths and say, okay, let's do this. And you walk on stage and then you're really solid. Aaron, you know, can I ask your reaction to that? Uh, H- hang yeah, on, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah, Go no, ahead. I think that's, like that's great advice. Um, and I love that you said slow and low breathing because I do think people talk about, um, you'll hear people say colloquially, like, take deep breaths. Oh, yeah. But then you end up hyperventilating because you're t- breathing in a not normal way. Like, it's slow exactly. and low. And even, you know, I, I mean, if I had to pick one way or the other, I'd say shallow, like you're sleeping is what I tell people. Imagine mm. what it's like when you're sleeping. You're taking very small breaths. I also think it's interesting, though, that you mentioned yawning because yawning is a signal that you don't have enough oxygen and when you feel panicky people almost always yawn because Mm. their body is trying really hard to catch up with the fear and get more oxygen so i know a lot of performers i do it too who yawn before they perform yeah i'm feeling a yawn coming on right now (laughs) (laughs) that's not a commentary that's just uh, you know power of suggestion right Mm -hmm. i feel it well, we're just about out of time. Is there anything else that anybody wants to add, sort of put the uh, the final word on the subject before we go? Well, I, I guess I do think that everyone can overcome this sort of performance anxiety, and it you know it might not you might not overcome it in the span of a year, or it could be it could be many 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 years before uh, you get over the fear of doing whatever. And um, I just have to think back quickly to when I was in grade school, and I this hang is on, a nightmare. Hang on. 
Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we have another story. I'm so excited. Oh, it's, it's brief. I'll um, try not to yawn. Go ahead. <laughs> Brad. <laughs> um, but for many, this is, I think, a dream, uh, a nightmare for others. But it really happened to me where you stand in front of a class of students and you have to give your presentation Mm. and you know back in the day we all had note cards so that we could keep our place and practice talking in front of people and then your hands get clammy because you get so nervous you think everyone's judging you and they are (laughs) (laughs) and then and then for me I dropped all the cards all over the place all 20 30 40 I don't know how many cards there were (laughs) but then they were all out of order and then what do you do in that moment you know you, you have to pick them up and awkwardly find your place and as a grade school student you know you're not practiced enough at that you point. don't have to do that you could just say okay i'm out of here <laughs> <laughs> oh you know you should have talked to uh, my younger self um, but really over the years i've i guess overcome that to a degree where y- you just yes you get escalating challenges throughout your life and then you have to find ways to cope and and visualize what it wants to, what you want that to look like in the future yeah. and then get there and i think that people can overcome it and the strategies that you've shared are great i've taken lots of notes <laughs> <laughs> and um it's 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 something that i think we all go through mm-hmm. yeah I, I think socially and with our interactions with people we tend to to put up that fourth wall right so to use an actor's term you know, breaking the wall, mm. breaking through, and, and realizing the other person is on the same level as you as mm-hmm. far as social engagement. Oh, that's I true. think that makes it easier yeah. if you just kind of, you know, be yourself, yeah. right? For sure. I, I always think when I go out on the stage, well, they want me to succeed. They don't want me to, Absolutely. you know, explode. Everyone's cheering for you. They're rooting for you when you're on stage. I just was um, in Cleveland this past week, and my son and I saw some theater. And in one of the shows, and it was community theater, so it's not like they were being paid to do the work, but um, a guy was singing a song, and he messed up his words, and you could he kind of, he was like mumbling through them, trying to catch back up with the orchestra. He was taking a minute. I mean, you just feel it. Every, I mean, I, I grabbed my kid's hand, because we're both performers. I was like, oh my gosh, you just, everyone feels bad for him. No one is like, oh my gosh, he stinks. Like, <laughs> you, you're yeah. honest. You're I like, want my money on, back. You can do this. You, yeah, right, get back. And once he did, and I'll tell you what, I've thought about it a number of times over the past couple of days. My son is also a musical theater performer um, and a pianist. And I feel like, I, I, might, I might need to write this guy a note, and I want to say to him, what a gift it is to share yourself as a performer and be vulnerable and risk having that happen and then also when it does to show younger people how do you recover he recovered beautifully but yet he made a huge mistake but no one cared the show as a whole was great Mm -hmm. and it was one moment but it it just i think it makes people remember like we're all human and people are going to mess up and there's nothing wrong with that yeah yeah I i think one thing that i always tell students is there was this time in i think the 1988 olympics and hang on (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry. I no, it's okay. I'm laugh. This was Go the ahead. 1988 Winter Olympics, and it was a figure skating competition. And a, a Japanese figure skater, you know, the weight of the country on her shoulders, she did a jump. And then this was back before they had all these fiber optic cables for all the cameras. She fell out of the arena into a hole that had been carved out for the cameras in the corner. And so I always remind students, you're Nothing is going to be worse than that. <laughs> and then she, and it was the bravest thing I'd ever seen. She climbed out of the camera pit, finished skating the rest of her routine, and it was really just wow. an amazing thing. Wow. So Fantastic. Well, just, Guts, so yeah. I kind of feel like Courage. if nothing will happen that will be worse than that. Mm. So, And if she could keep going, <laughs> you can too. Yeah. I'm kind of like a land where I never really struggled with mm-hmm. performance anxiety or stage fright. My mantra was always that I'm not afraid of the, stra- the stage. The stage is afraid of me, right? <laughs> and I was sort of oh, making you, a joke. You about... are the danger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that was my way of uh, of dealing with oh, it. No. that and a few glasses of wine <laughs> and a little bit of yawning, a little there yawning here and there. Yeah. yeah. So you're not bored. Yeah. No. You're just breathing. No. <laughs> well, that's all the time that we have for today. This program is a production of WGTE Public Media in collaboration with our sponsor, the Toledo Symphony, with generous support from the Rita Barber Kern Foundation. You can download episodes of our program as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org lab. 
You can also subscribe to us through your podcast app of choice, including Apple and Google Podcasts. Don't forget to check out all the upcoming events at the Symphony by visiting their website, that is ToledoSymphony.com, also their various social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. My thanks to Elaine Trudell, Merwin Sue, Felicia Canny, and our special guest, Aaron Wiley. I'm Brad Cresswell. You've been listening to Toledo Symphony Lab from FM 91.